again to another one of our tech talks. Uh, today is, I'd say, an exciting day because uh, Gerald's going to be going over string gauge technology, which will also lead into Derek's presentation that he'll be giving at the Thermal Spray Conference coming up on May, Monday, May 7th. Um, so, in a way, for Gerald, this might be your last tech talk before you officially re retire. Re re retire. <laughs> and which is also kind of leading into uh, Derek's presentation at the upcoming conference, which will actually be your first live presentation that you'll actually be giving at a conference, pretty right? Much. Pretty much. Second, second paper, though, for, for a conference. So um, we'll get started with Daryl with introducing string gauge technology, and then Derek will spin this off and show some of the cool things that we've used the technology for, for looking at uh, coding and adhesion. So Daryl, take it away. Okay. I was first introduced to strain gauge. Well, not exactly. I was introduced to strain gauges in the Air Force because they were uh, in the landing gear of the C-130s uh, for load balance. And that was the first time I'd ever run across them or heard about them at all. That would have been about 1968-ish. Um, but as far as hands-on, it was March 1972. Same, same day and time I got involved in thermal spray. Strain gauges operate on the principle that when attached to a device, any deformation in the device has a corresponding deformation in the gauge, um, which causes a uh, uh, change in resistance. So we're really measuring delta L over L, change in length over length, as a change in resistance over resistance. And that in a wheatstone bridge gives us a voltage offset that corresponds to strain. The resistance change in the, in the foil gauges that we deal with is related to dimensional changes that affect the structure of the, of the element, which is usually constantan, not always, and some minor piezo-resistive effects. Strain gauge was invented in 38 by I think his name is pronounced Rouge, um, but he was at MIT. And I think it's funny that the committee, the MIT committee that governed patents, didn't see any reason in the world for, th for strain gauges. So they, they just did a pass on it. Uh, and that's an a excerpt quote from them. And I, I just, it's funny. If you're a mechanical engineer, particularly, you'll appreciate the stupidity of that. It's like when IBM turned down Xerox. You know, they told Chester Carlton, well, ah, there's nothing in making copies. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they did. That's true. They turned him down. So Rouge um, felt a little differently about his invention, and he, uh, he had actually was helping one of his grad students um, I think they were doing something in yeah, seismology. But he got the poke around. He was going to go ahead and patent and then he found out this guy Simmons at Caltech had already done similar work a year before. So the two collaborated, decided to patent it together, and they did. And then they got in uh, league with this guy from MIT who was a little, apparently a little brighter than the rest of them at MIT, a little more forward thinking and they started to produce what was called the SR4 gauge after Simmons, who was first inventor, and Rouge was his second inventor. Those gauges are still available today. They're a free filament wire gauge, which in the day were put down with Duco cement, model cement. So in 39, they started this partnership and they got funding with Baldwin Southwark. Now, those are railroad engine manufacturers at the time. And they developed uh, the strain gauge and, and put it out for sale. And in 41, they got their first sizable order for gauges from Baldwin, who was making still boiler-fired steam engines. And they looked like that back in the day. That's their original handwriting. Uh, this is what the gauges looked like then, and they don't look a whole lot different today. They have this little felt thing on the back, so you can't really see the free filament. 
uh, but that was to help when you pressed it down with your thumb or a block to glue it down to the surface. And Duco cement takes a lot longer than super glue to, to set up. So you had to hold that thing down for quite a while. Um, and this is some of the early publications for the SR4. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, Baldwin eventually merged with Lima and Hamilton, BLH, who also made tensile testing machines, if you go back that far. They made these mass massive tensile testing machines, uh, really to support their railroad efforts. And there's one of their, their stocks. And there's, you can see the free filament in this one. And there's how they went to market. And you can still buy them in packaging that looks like that. And I looked on eBay, and you can still buy that package. Somebody has a bunch of those sitting around from almost day one. And you can go out and buy them. Not that you would. I used to have one, and I can't find it anymore. In 52, this kid in the UK came up with a chemically etched foil strain gauge, which is kind of like what we're using today, but we use photo etched gauges today. The problem with his gauges and being chemically etched is that the edges were not clean and sharp, and they had a fatigue problem, so they had limited use. Uh, they were good for laboratory, but because of the the, no the notch effect and the non-uniform etching, they weren't good for fatigue applications. And then in 63, Dentronics, now I've actually used Dentronics, um, came up with, with a way to die cut the gauge, which is amazing when you think about it. That these, element, these strands, which are tiny, this is on the order of a quarter inch long. This would be about an eighth of an inch active gauge, and these strands are small and they're die cut. When we were doing beryllium uh, strain gauges back in the day for nuclear work, because they have a nice cool cross section, uh, Dentronics did uh, beryllium die cut for us in the uh, 75, 76, somewhere around in there. Micro measurements in 62 uh, started with photo etch gauges. The age of electronics had come, we were making our first micro circuits. Photo etching was uh, becoming mature, and micro measurements formed. They've since been acquired by Vichet, um, and those are the gauges we're using. And the types we have now are bonded foil, the micro measurements gauges, semiconductor gauges, which are much more responsive to strain than the bonded foil, but they have stability issues. Uh, they, they just generate a lot of white noise. They're overly sensitive. And then weldable gauges, which is basically a foil or a wire embedded or mounted, uh, depending on which it is, to a shim stock that you can spot weld down to the surface. And then we still use free filament gauges for all of the high temperature work. Anything above about 600 degrees where the adhesives work, we use free filament gauges, which are applied by thermal spray. This is what a variety of, uh, of the foil gauges look like. This is a standard gauge. That's actually a CEA gauge. And it's terrible that I remember these things. Uh, but it's encapsulated. It's got a polyamide backing, backing. The element itself is constant tan, which is, has a low thermal coefficient of resistivity. So we don't have to deal much with, with temperature problems. The, the alloy, though, is adjusted specifically to match the substrate. So if I'm putting it on uh, pyrex or borosilicate, I might have one that's a zero. On steel, it would be it, in this designation has a six for six ppm. Aluminum would have a 13 for 13 ppm. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. But this one, this one would be put in uh, on a larger part this would be the primary axis of strain, and this is to negate Poisson's effect. Even though Poisson's effects on elements like this are small, if I have a precision instrument, I need to compensate for the transverse effects due to Poisson's ratio. This is a stacked gauge where my strain field 
This would be a, a strain field that's very large and uniform, or suspected to be large and uniform, and where I have uh, a, a lot of strain difference across a surface, uh, I would stack the rosette so that I can get the strain in all three directions at that precise location. And I don't have the, the differences here between the center lines. And this will give me, with a, a little bit of tricky math, a little trigonometry, when I have three of them stacked, I can get the direction of principal strain, which I can't get with any of these others. This is a version of that, again, where there's a large uniform strain field, and they don't have to be stacked. There is a problem with stacking them for precision because every element has a different distance from the center line of the part. So I have to put a calculation in there to get the strain gradient accounted for. These gauges go up to six inches now. It used to be just four inches. But this is the kind of thing I put on concrete where I have aggregate in it, and if I put a strain gauge on concrete that's a small gauge and it sits on top of a piece of stone, I'm not going to pick up anything. And if it sit and put, pick it up on the matrix, I'm going to get something different. And these very long gauges are meant to span all of the weird artifacts in uh, a heterogeneous material so I get uniform results from it. We've used a lot of those on concrete railroad ties. This one is unique. This one is set up. There's a, a three-legged apparatus that allows me to take an end mill and drill through the middle of that array and relieve the localized residual stress and measure the residual stress at that point. Uh, I've used those. Those are, those are tricky. They're tricky. You glue this tripod down and put an end mill cutter in it, and then you take a hand drill. Everything is rigid down here, and just drive the, the, uh, the end mill down through the array to relieve the stress. What you can't do, though, is induce more stress by the way you cut it. So it's a very technique, hands-on, artsy kind of way to do it. Um, the crazy people that I worked with, myself included, used to take gauges like this, much smaller, where the elements were a 64th of an inch. And then we would mount them and take a dental drill with a diamond burr and tree pan a pyramid around the gauge to relieve the stress in that location to measure residual stress. That's very artsy. You do it under a microscope and it takes all day and it makes you like this. There's a reason I'm like this. And it's from doing that hours and hours and hours under a microscope. And the way we checked to see if we were any good is we had completely normalized uh, steel, something that was dead soft, no residual stress, and we practiced on that. Put the gauges down, cut them out. They were zero to start with, they were zero, and we were done. So we knew that we weren't inducing any stress into it. The problem with doing this is that little dental burr turning at 10,000 RPM when you, you're just tired and you slip and it comes out of the metal and goes right across the element and cuts them all. That's the fun part, all that work. Here's what uh, semiconductor gauges look like and they are just what they sound like. It's a, a semiconductor element. Most of those have some piezoelectric, piezo-resistive uh, properties uh, and they're very, very sensitive. Uh, gauge factor in a foil gauge is two, it's a measure of sensitivity. Gauge factor in semiconductors can be anywhere from 100 to 1,000. Very, very sensitive. The trouble is they're very, very sensitive. Uh, and they can, if you have low strain levels, you can get better results, but you have to be really good at instrumentation. The weldable strain gauge, uh, this one is a foil gauge on a piece of shim stock. This one has wires embedded in this tube, again on shim stock, and then I can weld those down. There is a problem, of course, with strain transfer because this standoff distance becomes more significant, especially in bending. Free filament gauges, this is what I spent six years doing. 
um, as we developed, Battelle developed the basic alloy for this. It's an iron chrome aluminum alloy with 6% aluminum, similar to Hoskins 875, but 875 only has 5.5% aluminum. The idea is that I can use this at over 1000 C because with the heavy chrome and aluminum content at temperature, I develop a passive uh, scale on the fire that prevents further oxidation and I get a stable alloy at temperature. It also has, uh, if I look at a, an apparent strain curve, which is strain versus temperature, uh, it doesn't have much, it's not linear, none of these are, because of phase transformations in the material, but it's a very gradual S curve. <coughs> if you'd like to see that data, it's around here somewhere. Did I get those back from you, those books, the NASA books? Okay. <clears throat> we spent years developing this for initially the Atomic Energy Commission and then NASA. Factors to be considered with strain gauges would be adhesive selection. Uh, they're all the way from the super glue variety to high temperature phenolics, CTE matching to the substrate lead wire resistance contributions to the bridge, so we tend to use a three wire approach uh, to negate lead wire resistance. Excitation voltage, most excitation voltages are three volts, but in some applications, if I'm putting a strain gauge on plastic or something that has poor thermal conductivity, then the strain gauge becomes a heater. So when we put it on ceramics, uh, polymers, those sorts of things, we use one and a half volt excitation, <clears throat> sometimes even one volt excitation. It lowers the sensitivity, but that's a lot better than, than just frying the, uh, the installation. Stand off the center line, I've already mentioned, and then Poisson's effects, the transverse effects. Common resistances that we deal with are 120, these are worldwide industry standards, 120 and who knows how they started. Nobody knows how this stuff started, I don't. 120 ohm, 350 ohm and 1000 ohm are standard resistances for uh, string gauges. CTE matching, standard CTEs are zero for things that have little or no expansion. Uh, uh, three would be most of the refractory materials, tungsten, tantalum, that sort of thing. Uh, five and six uh, are steels and some stainless steels. Nine are the austenetic stainless steels, uh, aluminum, and 15, I think, is magnesium alloys. Somebody remember what that is? Gauge length standards go from a 64th up to a quarter, and then you have the, the very, very long gauges for heterogeneous materials. The bridges look like this. We're currently here using a quarter, it's a quarter bridge, uh, because we just have one strain gauge. We could, uh, if we went tension and compression on both sides, we could put them here and get double the output. Or we could put tension and compression in opposite legs and they would completely cancel out. <laughs> and this is a full bridge. As I mentioned before, some of you got in here. When I was at Battelle, we did an installation that had 32 arms. Instead of a quarter of one arm, two arm, or four arm, we, every arm of the Wheatstone Bridge had eight gauges in it to cancel bending and everything else in the world. Common uses, of course, load cells, pressure transducers, an interesting story here. I used to work with a crazy guy. I worked with a lot of crazy people. He was actually a chemist by training, but he developed the first diaphragm pressure transducer. So all of these load cells we have around <clears throat> for pressure transducers that are diaphragm related for gas and water pressure, all go back to Nelson Kreitz who came up with the idea of this complicated looking uh, strain gauge bridge, a four element bridge that goes on a, on a diaphragm so he could take advantage of the radial stress that, that is in a diaphragm. So instead of being a linear gauge, it, it looks funny. <laughs> I mean, you can see them if you, if you Google it, but 
but that was developed uh, at Mattel as well. Extensometers, uh, I think I have a picture of one of those. Uh, monitoring structural loads, whether they're permanently installed, and some are in high-rise buildings, especially around areas of, of high seismic activity. Uh, bridges often have strain gauges permanently mounted. They fall into the smart structure uh, category. Torque measurement, wind tunnel forces, medical testing. I have a story about that, and I don't have the part. I have a part with no gauges, but when we were developing uh, bone plates for, this is terrible, uh, what I did, but it was fun at the time. So at Battelle, we're working on, on uh, healing, uh, rapid healing for bone. And we had bone plates that were screwed on to a, a compound fracture to uh, pull the bone together in compression. There's an optimum amount of compression that a bone uh, needs to see for proper healing. If the bone is too far apart, the callus is too thick and weak. If you put the bone in too much compression, it kills the cells at the interface and slows down healing. And at the right compression, bone healing is very quick. But, but it's a balance, and we were studying that. So we were instrumenting strain gauges, working with the vet department at OSU, and uh, we'd put them in horses that came in injured and had these leads coming out of their leg, and we'd trot them around a circle and measure the stresses and strains at different levels of compression. Just the kind of thing you would do, right? So at that time, my wife falls and breaks her leg in three places. And she's at, she's at the OSU hospital, and she's being treated by the, uh, by the guy who took care of the OSU football team. And uh, so I went to visit her at lunch. She's laying there for a few weeks because she really, they have to wait for a lot of things before they can even glue her back together, but they're gonna put bone plates in her. <clears throat> so I took an instrumented bone plate over, and I said, guess what? I just talked to your doctor, and he agreed that you can be the first human subject in our study. <laughs> but it's okay, you'll just have this little silicon tube coming out of your leg with wires and we'll hook up to you occasionally and walk you down the hallway. And I just went on and on and on and she bought it. <laughs> she bought it. Of course, we didn't do that, but it was fun. <laughs> and we've been married 50 years. <laughs> okay. She's either, I'm a missionary project, or she's not too smart. <laughs> the poor woman. <laughs> That's a true story. This is one example of strain gauges being used for residual stress. This is a railroad rail cross section. Um, and the concerns were the residual stress developed in the head. The, um, the US rail industry knows where every rail is, when it was made, how many wheels have gone across it, and how much those wheels weigh. They have amazing records. So when you pull a piece of rail out, they can tell you exactly what its history is. So we took those rails, we put these <laughs> string gauges on it, and, and these are triaxial gauges, because we're looking for direction of principal strain at the same time then you can barely see the wires around the edges. There's a whole series of them around the edge as well. And then we took, I did, Don Lyons, who is the most patient man in the world, put this on a bandsaw and cut through this entire grid work to relieve each one of these and measure the residual stress. We all helped wire it. Everybody was working on wiring these together because it, it, we did a lot of them and they were tedious. But he also took the same rail, one meter long, ground the edges parallel, took precise measurements of the length, so it's exactly one meter, and then he took the same rail and cut these little rods out, these little sections, the whole length of the rail and then measured the bending and the change in length. So he spent hours on a bandsaw. I mean, can you imagine cutting something that precisely over a meter without varying? 
He, st he stood it, he stood, and he didn't just do one, one rail. He stood at that bandsaw for months with a hammer tapping and guiding the this, this saw so it cut straight through. And then we put them in a, a B block fixture, measured the change in length, measured the arc, the direction of the arc, correlated that with this data. And my part of the job was to make a photoelastic cast of the same rail and put it in um, polarized light and look at the principal stresses from loading the wheel in that direction. That was my part, apart from helping wire this thing and trying to comfort him for hours. <laughs> this is a piece of plumbing out of a breeder reactor, foil gauges to look at uh, the principal strain at room temperature and then high temperature gauges, uh, the free filament gauges, so that we could measure the temperature uh, in operation. This is uh, an investment cast IN100 bar being uh, heated direct resistance heating with free filament gauges. Here we're actually not testing the bar, we're testing the gauges for thermal shock. Heating rates up to 70 degrees a second. And yes, I had hair in those days. That is me. Proof that there's life after hair. <laughs> This is a, an extensometer. It's basically a full a forearm bridge. Uh, these are Wasp Alloy and Rene 41 components. It's pretty tiny, and uh, these clips would fit on a, on a pair of blocks on whatever it is you're trying to measure. Uh, but it's just a typical extensometer. Uh, we did a lot of work with General Electric. GE did a lot of their own work on looking at uh, stresses and strains in turbine blades. They had the capability to put on gauges. We had better capability, especially when we had higher temperature gauges. So we assisted GE in studying turbine blades. And this was a materials development. This is a 3D carbon-carbon composite uh, with a free filament strain gauge on it. And this is, I got some sort of nice thank you from NASA for this. It has ion implant to get it to stick. This is a zero expansion alloy and they wanted momentary data as high as they could get it. So they took it up to the melting point of the wire. Uh, but it had ion implantation nickel chrome, PVD nickel chrome, thermal spray nickel chrome, 50-50 nickel chrome alumina, and then the alumina dielectric for the gauge and the overcoat. All of that to protect it and get it to adhere because this was gonna be put in a tensile machine that was electrically charged to heat it, and uh, the thermal shock was just extraordinary. So to make sure it stuck long enough to get good data, I did all that back in the day. So the work that was done at Battelle and other places in the 70s, all of this cute work with photoelastic measurements, all the strain gauge work that we did, formed the basis for all of the data we currently have in our uh, CAD programs. We were the, the, the folks, we and others, mostly Battelle, who developed the, uh, the initial grid works for finite element analysis. So now your, your frame, back then the framework was crude. The frame cells were large. Uh, we've gotten better and better at it, but all of that came from empirical work done with strain gauges back in the 70s. And here's some of the manufacturers. This is a German outfit. They make good product. Micro measurements is the biggest one here. High tech makes gauges. Um, I would still buy from one of these two. And Omega, Omega is a, a private label. And I don't know who's they're buying. My, one of the two of these, and then there's some others. I don't know who's doing it in Japan. Side story, and then I'll quit. The Japanese strain gauge industry came out of the Second World War. They got hold of a crashed bomber, and it had these wires, these funny little squiggly wires in the wings, and, and they couldn't figure out what it was. And one of the Japanese engineers at the time, of course, they're looking for secrets, in the plane, right? So 
he's tearing, they're tearing the plane apart and he finds these squiggly little wires stuck in the wings that he couldn't figure out initially what they were. But he was persistent and smart and he eventually reverse engineered it and figured out they were string gauges. And out of that was born the string gauge industry in Japan. Okay, that's it for me.